Hello again. In this uh, video lecture, we're going to start covering um, some additional details about erythrocytes or RBCs, which are go away, which are the uh, main subject of this chapter. Oops, hang on. All right, behave. I command you to behave. Come on. All right, here we go. Erythrocytes in a little bit more detail. This is what a red blood cell would look like if you could magnify it um, tremendously and a lot more than you could possibly magnify it with uh, typical light microscopes you would find in a college laboratory. But if you look at them, they kind of look like a, a piece of red candy that's compressed in the center and wider around the edges. And that shape is actually said to be biconcave. Uh, erythrocytes or red blood cells are sometimes called biconcave discs because they're pretty flat but then they're compressed in the center. You guys remember from maybe from elementary school concave is like that, convex is like that. So they're biconcave because they dip inward on the top and also on the bottom. That's what's meant by biconcave. A nucleate, they don't have a nucleus uh, and essentially no organelles. So those most of those little membrane cover compartments you learned about at the beginning of biology 201 they're gone in these erythrocytes because they're not really needed for their functions erythrocytes really what they are they're big bags full of hemoglobin which is a type of protein that transports oxygen gas throughout the body hb by the way is an abbreviation for hemoglobin we'll be talking a lot about hemoglobin in this unit, so you want to get used to seeing that um, abbreviation. Your erythrocytes, interestingly, um, so the smallest blood vessels in your body are called capillaries, and some of those capillaries that extend, you know, very deeply into uh, your tissues are so thin that they're actually wider, or narrower, I'm sorry, than a typical red blood cell. So because of that, your red blood cells have to be very flexible in order to be able to squeeze through those thinnest microscopic blood vessels. And um, they're able to do that because of, hang on, let me erase some of that there so you can read that. Um, they're able to do that because there's a protein that's present in the membranes of erythrocytes called spectrin. And spectrin allows them to be more, to be squishier, more flexible than uh, most other cell types. Your erythrocytes are, now they make up on average about 45% of your blood volume. And um, so because of that, they are the major factor that contributes to your blood viscosity, your blood thickness. Okay, so that means if you have more erythrocytes in your blood than you're supposed to, your blood's going to be thicker than it's supposed to. If you have fewer, it will be thinner than it's supposed to. All right, so why do your erythrocytes have that biconcave shape? And uh, the reason why that occurs, red blood cells, their main, um, their main function is gas transport, O2. Okay, so O2 enters red blood cells by diffusion, and it has to exit the blood cells by diff the red blood cells by diffusion as well. So um, things that function in diffusion need to have a large surface area or things that function in absorption need a large surface area to allow substances to uh, pass across. So that biconcave shape that it has, it actually gives the erythrocyte a larger surface area, a larger membrane surface area through which oxygen gas can um, diffuse inward and outward. Inside an erythrocyte, so we said this hemoglobin protein is pretty important. And um, about 97%, if you remove the water, about 97% of what you would have left um, making up the weight inside an erythrocyte is hemoglobin, these hemoglobin proteins. Again, hemoglobin proteins bind O2. They drop it off in your tissues they pick it up, hemoglobin picks up oxygen gas in your lungs, and then it drops it off 
in your tissues, which we'll be learning more about later. Your red blood cells don't have any mitochondria. If you guys remember from Biology 201, the mitochondria are the powerhouses where ATP is produced through aerobic cellular respiration. So your erythrocytes, really, because they're basically just these uh, bags of hemoglobin floating around in your bloodstream, they really don't need a lot of ATP anymore. They're not doing a lot of metabolizing. They're not really building new parts and replacing um, old ones and, and so forth. So they don't need as much ATP as other cells do. Um, they can produce it. They can produce it through anaerobic respiration, kind of like your skeletal muscles do when you're sprinting. And uh, you can make ATP quickly. You don't require O2 to make that happen. So your erythrocytes can do that. This is a good thing because imagine if your erythrocytes did do aerobic cellular respiration, then they would be consuming the oxygen gas that they were transporting. So uh, that would not be a good thing. Your textbook po points out as well that the shape, um, the limited components, the fact that they're really nothing but bags of hemoglobin makes your erythrocytes a really good example of uh, form following function. Remember, maybe you heard uh, that expression at the beginning of Biology 201. The shape of these cells is completely optimized and their, uh, their composition, their structure is uh, perfectly optimized for their job, which is basically to pick up oxygen and drop it off in your tissues. Alrighty, so uh, a little bit more about hemoglobin and this oxygen gas transport that takes place. Hemoglobin, so your, our, your red blood cells, that's their main job, is to transport, pick up oxygen gas in the lungs, transport it to your tissues, drop it off in the tissues, uh, and then go back to the lungs and pick up more oxygen gas. So because of that, hemoglobin has to bind reversibly with O2. All right, so if this is a hemoglobin protein, that means O2 has to be able to attach, but then it also has to be able to leave the hemoglobin and uh, enter into the tissues where it's supposed to go to supply cells. So this O2 moves from the air in your lungs into hemoglobin proteins in your red blood cells, and then when those red blood cells wind up, in capillaries in your tissues, the O2 molecules come off of hemoglobins and move into the tissues where they're needed. Uh, you can do tests where you measure hemoglobin values um, in male uh, in patients, and again, as we've seen before with other things, males tend to have more hemoglobin per blood volume than females. In a male, it's about 13 to 18 grams of hemoglobin for every 100 milliliters of blood. A milliliter ml is one one thousandth of a liter. So a hundred milliliters is one tenth of a liter. You guys know about how big a liter is, like a two liter bottle of Coke. So a hundred milliliters is about one twentieth of a two liter bottle of Coke. So a little bit more hemoglobin in males than in females. And again, that's because we have to go out and do all that hunting and gathering and running and chasing wild game and so forth out on the on the plane so that we can bring food home for our family. So that's why we need, uh, we're more likely to get chased by lions and things like that. So uh, that's why we need more hemoglobin. We need more red blood cells to uh, funnel O2 to our skeletal muscles to allow those types of things to happen. All right, so hemoglobin. What does hemoglobin look like? We keep talking about this. Hemoglobin is a protein. This thing doesn't want me to draw on it. Here we go. Hemoglobin is a protein. So it's a large organic molecule. Proteins are chains of amino acids, if you guys remember. And um, in reality, though, hemoglobin is really four proteins. Four protein chains, or sometimes people call them um, let me 
most all right here we go polypeptide chain sorry my stylus is not cooperating with me here <clears throat> polypeptide is another term that refers to a chain of amino acids um, so you'll see sometimes you'll see those expressions used interchangeably if you're reading along in your textbook so hemoglobin consists of four polypeptide chains or chains of amino acids they could also be referred to as four proteins as well two of those are called alpha chains and two of those are called beta chains and they're also known as this is the Greek letter alpha alpha globins and beta globins all right so on this diagram over here that little brown squiggly there and that brown squiggly there those are your two beta globin proteins and the lighter tan ones over here are called alpha globin so you put those four together and you have a big hemoglobin protein all right so then each of those globin proteins alpha and beta has one copy of a molecule in it called heme there's one two three and the fourth one is over there and if you blow up heme this is the chemical structure for heme I know you don't have to memorize that they're just showing that there for you so that you can see what it looks like it is a um, it's an organic type molecule heme is not itself a protein it is a different type of organic molecule um, heme is also called a pigment pigment are chemical pigments are chemical compounds that have color so heme is actually what gives blood its red color and it changes from a, a brighter red when oxygen gas is attached to a darker red when there's less oxygen gas attached to the hemes in your red blood cells notice also what do you see there in the center of the heme molecule right in there fe fe is the chemical symbol for iron so you have an iron atom in the center of the hemes and then you have four hemes each with an iron in each hemoglobin molecule that you see over here so now you've probably heard no doubt before that you need iron to not become anemic and to have proper red blood cell function so that's probably not a surprise to you that you have iron in these uh, heme molecules that are part of your hemoglobins okay so that's a little background about what hemoglobin molecules are okay so much of this I've already mentioned but that iron atom so the hemes the central iron atom of each of those binds one O2 so how many O2's can you bind in each hemoglobin protein each hemoglobin protein can transport four O2's because you have four hemes each has an iron each of those can bind an O2 gas molecule how many of these things do you have in each of your red blood cells about 250 million hemoglobin molecules in each little itty bitty red blood cell so they're kind of important and then also how many red blood cells do you have 20 to 30 trillion at any given time and that means even in like a little tiny pinprick drop of blood you would have millions of red blood cells each containing 250 million hemoglobin molecules so hemoglobin is kind of important each of those hemoglobins can bind up to four oxygen gas molecules that you've taken in from the lungs so that kind of lets you know um, how quickly that O2 is used by the cells in your body all right here's a diagram that's showing again what happens sort of the cycle that goes on with the hemoglobin proteins in your red blood cells <clears throat> O2 loading occurs in the lungs so when your blood passes into the lungs and we'll learn more about this later um, especially when we get into unit three 
Oxygen gas comes out of the air spaces in your lungs and into the blood. Uh, that exchange takes place there. And the O2 molecules bind to hemoglobin. And hemoglobin at that time when it uh, has a lot of oxygen gas attached uh, is sometimes called oxyhemoglobin at that point. Okay, and those hemes have a ruby red color at that time. Now, when you guys see anatomy diagrams with red and blue blood, red means oxygen rich, and that bluish color means low oxygen levels. It does not mean that your blood is really uh, that color, the, but the standard is to use, or the convention is to use red on blood vessel diagrams to represent oxygen rich blood and blue to represent blood that's low in oxygen. All right, so uh, little tiny microscopic blood vessels pass through your tissues. O2 and nutrients come out of the blood um, to supply those tissues and that's when your hemoglobins have now lost oxygen gas and they become deoxyhemoglobin or sometimes called reduced hemoglobin. That has a dark red color. Also, uh, your tissues over here are doing cellular respiration. And what's a major output of cellular respiration? Good old CO2. So that CO2 gets taken up by the blood as it's exiting the tissue. And some of that CO2, about 20%, actually attaches to hemoglobin. It does not attach at the same place where O2 does. But when hemoglobin has CO2s attached to it, uh, that's called carbamino hemoglobin. And that's one of the ways in which CO2 winds up being transported um, in the blood back to the lungs so that you can exhale it out of the body is by uh, some of it attaching to your hemoglobin molecules. All right, so that was just a little bit of an overview of erythrocytes and uh, introduction to hemoglobin. In the fourth video lecture for chapter 17, we're going to talk about uh, blood cell formation. Blood cell formation, that is called hemato. Hemato, when you see that, is generally referring to the blood. And poiesis is, an, um, is a root word that refers to, to create or to form. So hematopoiesis actually literally means blood formation. And we'll uh, talk a little bit about how that all works in the fourth lecture for chapter 17.